the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Glory to God in the highest, and peace to his people on earth. Lord God, Heavenly King, Almighty God and Father, we worship you, we give you thanks, we praise you for your glory. Lord Jesus Christ, only Son of God, Lord God, Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world, have mercy on us. You are seated at the right hand of the Father, receive our prayer. For you alone are the Holy One, you alone are the Lord, you alone are the Most High, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit, and the glory of God the Father. Amen. The Lord be with you. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. O Almighty God, who brings good out of evil, and turns even the wrath of your children towards your promised peace, hear our prayers this day as we remember those of many nations and different faiths whose lives are cut short by the fierce flames of anger and hatred. Hasten the time when the menace of war shall be removed. Cleanse both of us and, and those perceived to be our enemies of all hatred and distrust. Pour out the spirit of peace on all the rulers of our world, that we may be brought through strife to the lasting peace of the kingdom of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Please be seated for the blessing. Blessed be the Lord, 
in the letter of Paul to the church in Rome. What then are we to say about these things? If God is for us, who is against us? He who did not withhold his own son, but gave him up for all of us, will he not with him also give us everything else? Who will bring any charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is to condemn? It is Christ Jesus who died, yes, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who indeed intercedes for us. Who will separate us from the love of Christ? Will hardship, or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or peril, or sword? As it is written, For your sake we are being killed all day long. We are accounted as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to Matthew. Glory to you, Lord Christ. When Jesus saw the crowds, he went up to the up the mountain, and after he sat down, his disciples came to him. Then he began to speak and taught them, saying, "Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn." For they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. 
Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts always be acceptable in your sight. O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. Good morning. Good morning. In uh, 2002, I made a decision that uh, every September 11th, and uh, on September 11th were the Sunday closest, that I would preach a sermon uh, in memory of my friend who died at the World Trade Center. And I tell the same story, it's the only sermon that I do that is exactly the same year from year. Um, the first part I do adapt a little bit. But the second part, which is Jimmy's story, has stayed the same since 2002. And it's been important for me because as the years have gone by, I've realized that many of the things that we talk about in this homily or that we say in the service of remembrance has way too much applicability to all the things that go on in life. And, and the pain that we suffered on that day gets relived in many different ways and in many different events. And so for me, this is about Jimmy and all the Jimmies that we have in our lives. So my sermon for Jimmy. As I live, says the Lord, every knee shall bow to me, and every tongue shall give praise to God, so that each of us will be accountable to God. About 10 years ago, I woke up to a headline in USA Today that screamed, is 9-11 becoming just another day? And I didn't really think that that would be a problem ever, because how could it? How, how could we forget? How could we forget something as, as grievous as the direct hits on a major U.S. city in modern times? And how could we forget hatred, that kind of hatred and the blatant disregard for the other? And how could we forget the failure to respect the dignity of all and all of God's creation? How could we fail to remember the devastation and the loss of life. And I believe that because evil, injustice, hatred, terror, oppression, they thrive when good people become complacent and they forget. So I didn't read the article because I didn't believe it could ever be so, because to forget would be unthinkable. But then an older and wiser friend remarked to me that Wow, that was how he felt about December 7th. And I thought, hmm, okay, we remember December 7th, but those memories fade. And yet, as I looked around this, this actual week, there were some events, because 9-11 is a national day of remembrance, uh, but that article and, and my friend were very prophetic. In fact, I was taken aback by the fact that there are some memorial services, particularly at the sites, but that even in the Diocese of New York, there was no specific memorial service. 
And so I thought, hmm, it's a good thing I'm remembering. Because in the midst of the fires that block out the sky and the chaos in the streets and a pandemic that has taken us over, I think it has become another day. And maybe it's just another day for the many of young people that you see out there because the freshmen who started college this year, they were born after 9-11. To them, it, this is just the memories of their parents and their grandparents. And what they know of it comes from photos and any news reports that happen to be on. And it's about a day where the buildings came down and the planes crashed and terrorists took over and a war on terror began. So for them, maybe it is just another day. But it's not just another day for those of us who lost loved ones and family and friends and those things that we remember well. And so for me, it's not another day because on that day, I got a call from a friend who said, turn on the TV. The World Trade Center tower has been hit by a plane. And I was not panicked, I was horrified. But as someone who grew up as the towers were being built, I could remember all the arguments that my family and my parents and the adults have about how someday a plane would hit one of those towers. Because after all, there are three major airports all fighting for airspace in one little area and a bunch of small ones. There's planes all the time. And so everyone said it would be inevitable that someday some plane would wind up in one of those buildings. And I thought, well, the inevitable has come. And I was watching when the second plane hit. And then I knew that it was not inevitable. A new inevitable had come into life. No, it's not another day for me. It's the day my friend died. And I've often been asked over the years, as a New Yorker, if I knew anyone who had been killed in the trade, World Trade Center. And the days and some of the months after, uh, I believed that my friend had escaped. And those of us who grew up with him, uh, we all believe that too. Since as the chief of police for the Port Authority, he no longer patrolled the World Trade Center itself, but he was stationed at their headquarters in New Jersey. And so we were all sure that he was fine because his name did not show up on the lists of the dead and the missing. But a number of months later, a friend sent me an email with an article on six officers' bodies recovered from the rubble along with the body of the woman they were trying to rescue. They had made it all the way to the lobby carrying the woman when the North Tower, the second one, collapsed. And it was five months to the day of the attacks. And on that day, the name of Chief James A. Romito, a good man, headed that list. I know I have and have had a hard time comprehending such hatred, such a desire to inflict harm on others, such a disregard for the harm that you do to others, such blatant disregard for life. I, I have a hard time with it. I, I don't understand it. I have a hard time comprehending it when I heard about Oklahoma City way back when, or the anthrax scares, suicide bombers, Madrid bombings, the London train bombing, school shootings, so many things over the years. I have a hard time comprehending where such disregard for life comes from. I know where it comes from, but I still can't comprehend it. Where does such disregard for the pain inflicted upon others, such disregard for the beauty of all God's creation come from? Because it is incomprehensible. 
Such evil is incomprehensible. We may call it whatever you wish. Terrorism, hate crimes, injustice. Give it a name. But it is evil. After the London train bombings, the chief rabbi of London, Sir Jonathan Sachs, said, These terrible events have brought home to us the full evil that terror represents. For it is not the weapon of the weak against the strong, but the rage of the angry against the defenseless and the innocent. It is an evil means to an evil act. And no, remembering for today, it is not just another day. Because undoubtedly on September 11th, every media channel will bombard us with the stark and horrible images of the destruction of the World Trade Center and the Pentagon, and they will bring up all of their B-roll file and talk about it briefly and give it its 12 seconds. But these images join those we all too often of late see daily on the news, the carnage and the pain inflicted upon the defenseless and the innocent. It is difficult not to be overwhelmed by images like this, to feel a sense of hopelessness. It's impossible not to ask, where is God? And how do we overcome this incomprehensible evil? What do we do to fight such darkness in one's soul? And how do we explain to our children the forces that drive anyone to commit such acts of pain and suffering and evil? And every time it happens, I remind myself that we must have faith. Faith in God, faith in God's goodness, and faith in the power of God's grace and love. In Matthew's Gospel, chapter 16, verse 18, it states, I will build my church and the gates of Hades will not prevail against it. Some of the Bible translations substitute the word hell for Hades, but the two words are very different. In the Greek, Hades means the realm of the dead, for the good and the bad not just a place of punishment. But actually, Hades in Greek mythology was the ruler of the underworld. The world word Hades has become synonymous with the place. So what are the gates of Hades that will not prevail, literally not be stronger than the church of Jesus Christ? In Jesus' day, people understood the power and the strength of, of these big gates. If you've ever seen the movie Troy, you get the image of what kind of gate Jesus is talking about. They were the kind of gates that they had at the entrance to Jerusalem as well. These were huge gates that protect, protected the cities from uh, those who were assaulting them. So how strong the gate determined how strong the realm. And commentaries on that passage usually focus on the meaning of the realm of death, that Jesus will break death's hold and death's power by his resurrection, and that the gates of Hades will not withstand Christ's resurrection assault upon them. But not only he, but all the redeemed among the dead shall rise again and stride confidently through the broken gates. But there is a secondary meaning for Hades, with its five rivers, woe, lamentation, despair, forgetfulness, and fire, and the famous, infamous River Styx, the river of hate. For it is the portal to the world of darkness and the demonic, a metaphor for the power of evil or despair. The promise from Matthew is that the power of the goodness and light and the power of God and the church will prevail against the powers of darkness, that through faith and God's grace and God's love, goodness and light will triumph over evil. We will triumph over evil. And goodness and grace were there fighting death and darkness and evil on September 11th. They were there with those passengers who gave their lives in a field in Pennsylvania rather than let their plane fly into the Capitol. 
They were there with the firefighters, the police, call them first responders, the average citizens at the towers and the Pentagon who risked and gave their lives so that others might survive. And some called it the triumph of the spirit or courage. I say it was the forces of light and goodness prevailing against an evil means to an evil end. So no, it was not just another day. Although it was just another day for my friend Jimmy. Jimmy wasn't that kind of friend that I get to see all the time because once I moved to Ohio, it was kind of hard. And, but much more than an acquaintance, not someone I had done more than send cards to or notes to over the years. In fact, it wasn't until a few years before 9-11 that we all in my school reconnected through a reunion of classmates. But whenever I think about growing up, my first thoughts have always been of him. So I can't think of any way to honor a good and decent man, a force of good, lost to his family and the world, than to tell you a little about him. Because as long as I remember him and honor his memory, he will not be forgotten and it will not be another day. And the day and Jimmy stay with us. So we remember him as the tallest one in our class at St. Dominic's in the Bronx. But he was tall in stature as well as height, even in the third grade. Even as kids, he stood out among us as the one with presence and the one we all listened to. He was the natural leader and tall. In kindergarten, when the nuns would line us up by size, I would be the first one in the girls' line, and Jimmy would be the last one in the boys' line. Always seemed, it seemed, in the back row. Even in the seats and the, the little desks we had, Jimmy would always be in the back row. And I would always be in the right corner, front. Jimmy and I were the ones who always got sent to some Catholic school competition, some spelling bee somewhere. And we'd ride the subways, kids, to various parts of New York for whatever it was. And we made quite a pair given our differences in size. Okay, my mom used to say, oh, Mutt and Jeff are going up somewhere. But I always felt safe doing this with Jimmy because he was my big brother, because I didn't have a big brother, and he was my protector. And I remember our last trip together for I think it was a diocesan spelling bee, and it gave him, and because I was with him, me, an opportunity to sightsee in Manhattan. And one of those sites being the hole in the ground that eventually would become the World Trade Center. And on our way home, when we took the long route, we stopped at Yankee Stadium because he just had to look at it. He just loved New York. We weren't supposed to do this. We were supposed to go and come straight home. And Sister Fidelitas never knew. Well, maybe she did know, but she thankfully didn't say anything. So that's why at our school reunion, while we all expressed surprise at what each other was doing in our lives and our careers, everyone thought it fitting and not surprised that Jimmy had become a police detective with the Port Authority. For those of you that have heard of the Port Authority but not sure what it is and does, the Port Authority owns the site on which the Trade Center was located and had offices and its station house in the Twin Towers. The Port Authority manages the bulk of the transportation system between New York and New Jersey, including the tunnels, the bridges, a bus terminal, shuttle trains, and the Newark, LaGuardia, and Kennedy airports. The Port Authority Police Department, or the PAPD, is the authority's multi-jurisdictional police force. And Jimmy and his five comrades rushed from the Port Authority Police Headquarters in New Jersey to help in the evacuation of the World Trade Center. And they were doing a floor-by-floor -floor search for people. Now, as the Port Authority Police Chief, Jimmy could have stayed at headquarters when he heard the news that a plane had crashed into Tower One, but that was not his way. 
In his last cell phone conversation with his fiancée on the morning of the September 11 attack, Jimmy told her, I have to save people, and then ran towards what she heard as screams. Witnesses said they saw him on the 31st floor, guiding people to the exits and safety. He had rushed to people's aids many times in his 30-year career with Port Authority. He was among the rescuers at the World Trade Center in 93, when a terrorist exploded a bomb in the basement garage. He was the chief detective for that investigation and worked closely with the FBI. And we all remembered seeing him on TV, standing behind the mayor during news conferences. He was easy to pick out, and we all laughed that some things hadn't changed much because he was still in the back row, the tallest one in the group. He was at Kennedy Airport following the crash of TWA Flight 800 over Long Island in 96, and he worked on that investigation. He had to be tough as a cop, but he was also a soft-hearted guy. He worked tirelessly with the homeless, and the Port Authority lauded him for developing Operation Alternative, a program that connects homeless people who frequent the agency's bus terminals and shelter to send them to shelters and, and to social workers. He helped runaways, received praise from the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children for all of his efforts to protect them. He was the recipient, recipient of numerous awards and medals for his commitment to public service. He was also in charge of community policing plan that he developed at the Port Authority bus terminals of Port Newark and Elizabeth Port Marine Terminals. And he belonged to various community groups where he gave of his time selflessly. Ironically, he was engaged to be married in the spring and was due for retirement shortly after 9-11. The Port Authority police were largely ignored in the 9-11 media aftermath. They didn't have to rush to the World Trade Center because they were already there. Jimmy Rush. There were no photos of their precinct or station house draped with black crepe because their station house was gone. And then he and his comrades quietly joined a long list of the known and unknown heroes of that day, warriors for good, who on that day prevailed against the gates of darkness. And Jimmy is just one force for good, but he reminds me and us today that as we face new catastrophes, and new horrors, and new struggles, and new shootings, and hurricanes, and tornadoes, and injustice, wherever we see it, that there are many like him, many like him, many who stay in dangerous areas to protect others and who give their lives to do it, those who welcome the strangers into their homes, those who've lost practically everything, yet still find time to help others. Because behind all the stories of tragedy and evil, there are the stories of triumph. We have only to look, only to hope, only to pray, only to have faith, only to act. So I ask today for your prayers for those who have lost themselves to the call of evil, injustice, intolerance, and all of that, that they may hear the true word of God and receive God's grace and may their hearts be open to the power of the Holy Spirit. May the Holy Spirit direct and rule their hearts and guide it to God's will. And let them be known, let them know that all God's creation must live in love and justice and peace. And I ask your prayers today for those who suffer from the results of terror and evil of any kind, any place, and any day. And from the horrors of all of those tragedies, and especially for those who relive this day, and those who lost loved ones to any form of terror. We ask that God keep them from turning to despair, and let them be filled with hope and grace for tomorrow. And let us remember in our prayers those that have lost their lives on this day, that they may find eternal rest and a place at the heavenly banquet where there is no fear, no injustice, no pain, no hunger, 
no despair. And let us pray too that God will send us the grace and the courage to persevere in the face of evil and despair and be those forces of goodness, justice, and compassion that fight against the darkness. And let us pray that we may take every opportunity to have faith and to do good and to be those stories of triumph behind the stories of tragedy. And I hope that you will include Jimmy Stanley, his friends, and his community that has lost someone because we all miss him terribly. And so for us, all of us, it can never be just another day. But for Jimmy, our prayers are different. We give thanks to God for the grace of having known him, for the work that he did among us, for his examples of kindness and goodness, for the grace and the courage he shared in our lives. And I believe in the promise of the resurrection that someday we will see him again. And on that day, we will know him well, for he will be standing with the company of the saints in heaven, most likely in the back row. He is the tall one. Let us say the prayers of the people responsibly. With all our heart and all our mind, we pray to you, O oh Lord. May the blessings of the peace. For the peace of the world, that a spirit of respect and forbearance may grow among nations and peoples, we pray to you, O oh Lord. For all who believe in you, Lord Christ, and all who 
whose faith is known to you alone, that they may be delivered from the darkness of fanaticism that arises from poverty and oppression, and from the pride that arises from wealth and comfort, brought and brought into your light, so that the divisions that foster violence may cease, we pray to you, O Lord. There is this Lord, that is such a For those who have lost their faith in you, O God, for those who continue to mourn, those who died in the World Trade Center, the airplanes, and the Pentagon, may your church give comfort and hope in this time of remembrance. We pray to you, O Lord. There is there is God, let us serve faith. For all those whose spirit has been broken and whose lives have been irrevocably disrupted by the violence of that day and its aftermath, we offer our prayers along with the persecuted, the lonely, and the sick who have bid our prayers today, that they may be relieved and protected. Especially we pray for those who were lost that day and who families who were who lost loved ones that day. We pray to you, O Lord. For there is despair, let us hope. For the mission and ministry of the Episcopal Church, that we may listen to the gospel of reconciliation and proclaim it in word and action for the building of your reign here on earth, we pray to you. O Lord, where there is darkness, let us some light. For all who died in the terror of September 2001, and for those others whom we remember today, for those who believed in your resurrection, and those who knew not your promise of eternal life, entrust that they may have found by you and are at rest in your holy habitation. We pray to you. We pray for the concerns of our parish. And we pray for the forgiveness of our sins.
there are announcements on, on the back page uh, of the bulletin. And um, so, let's see, we have the adult forum today at noon uh, with Zoom. And uh, let's see, and of course we have all of our evening prayers this week. So I hope that you will join us and continue to join us. And if you're having any problems doing so, please call the office and leave a message and we'll get back to you and help you with all of that. And so there's no other announcement. Uh, the blessing. And the blessing of God Almighty Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be upon you and remain with you always. Amen. Amen. Deacon. Go in peace, the love, and serve the Lord.